بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين In the previous session we were talking about the, pre, the last two sessions actually we were uh, talking in detail about pre-Islamic Arabian society so what were some of the conditions that were present at the time of the Prophet ﷺ's birth and so therefore what were some of the circumstances that he was dealing with what were some of the challenges that he faced and it also allows us to further appreciate the work that he was able to do Last time, in talking about pre-Islamic uh, Arab society, we specifically talked about the religious condition, the spiritual state of pre-Islamic society at that time. Um, what I wanted to talk about today is a bit of an extension of that, but nevertheless, it's also, uh, I feel like, an independent topic and subject. What I first wanted to lead off with, what I wanted to start off with was a narration that talks about what was a, a specific dynamic. It mentions a very specific dynamic of that spiritual state of the people before Islam in that region and at that time. And I didn't get to this last time, but I, I wanted to start off with this. Uh, Abu Raja al-Atar رضي الله عنه he says قال كنا في الجاهلية إذا لم نجد حجرا جمعنا جثوة من تراب وجئنا بالشاد فحلبناها عليه ثم طفنا به he says that before Islam كنا في الجاهلية in the days in the time in the era of ignorance إذا لم نجد حجرا if we could not find a an idol if we couldn't find an actual structured idol, a constructed idol to worship, جَمَعْنَا جَثْوَةً مِنْ تُرَابٍ What we would do is we would get together a bunch of dirt. We would literally go out into the field, like just imagine stepping out here, and we'd gather together all the dirt and all the little stones and little things that we could find, the debris just lying around. We would just gather a bunch of dirt together, and we would just kind of build it into a little bit of a mound. وَجِئْنَا بِشَاتٍ And then we'd find the nearest goat that we could find, and we would milk the goat on top of that little mound that we had built. فَحَلَبْنَاهَا عَلَيْهِ We'd milk the goat right on top of that little dirt mound. ثُمَّ طُفْنَا بِهِ And then what we would do is then we'd start doing tawaf of it. We'd literally start doing tawaf of it. That tells you two things. And I wanted to talk about this because we need to understand this. The first thing it tells you, the obvious thing that it tells you is how bad the, con- the spiritual state of the people was at that time. How badly deteriorated their spiritual condition was before Islam. That they had reached a point in time, in a place where their spiritual fulfillment was literally in this in this form. They would they they would spiritually fulfill themselves by put just gathering a bunch of dirt together, milking a goat on it, and start doing tawaf and worshiping this dirt with goat's milk on it. Like just think of that. So that's the obvious observation. That that's how bad and how deteriorated their situation was. Having said that, at the same time, that tells us something. Very, if we look a little bit deeper, if we're will, willing to look past the surface, that tells you something else that's very interesting. And so, what he's describing here is the predicament of the common person, the common person. And so, what that tells you is something very interesting. See, a, a real, the real challenge. And the worst situation possible for a person to be spiritually in is when a person absolutely has no concern, no motivation, no inclination towards any type of spirituality at all. You understand? When somebody is so far and distant from any type of, it, uh, of iman, where they don't even feel the need to pray to anything, to seek help from anything, that a person becomes, the human being becomes so arrogant where it's like forget about what they worship and how they worship, he doesn't even feel the need to worship. He doesn't feel the need to worship. Alright? That's the worst possible condition for a human being. What we're seeing in the common people of that time is, yes, this is, it's, it's very sad, their state and their condition, that they would worship a bunch of dirt, and they would milk goat on top of dirt and they would worship it. That's really, really sad. But you know what that still shows you at the end of the day? It shows you that these people were still desperate. They were desperate. They were looking for something. 
Now the problem is, is that they didn't know exactly what they were looking for. They didn't know how to look for it. They didn't know where to access it. But it does not change the fact that they were still somehow, some way, spiritually motivated, spiritually connected. That that that's something that you have to you have to observe that you have to make note of that. Because that plays a major role in the message, in the da'wah of the Prophet ﷺ. And that's why the Prophet ﷺ, in the initial stages of his preaching and his message, who were the vast majority of people that were coming forth? Who were the people that were accepting Islam and um, latching on to the message that the Prophet ﷺ brought? It was the lower part of society. The lower part of society, like like Musa, like excuse me, Nuh ﷺ was told in the Quran by his people, what tabakal? Ardalun. These very lonely people follow you. You know, and even the Quraysh made a demand to the Prophet ﷺ at one time. They said, You're after us all the time. You want us to listen to you, you want us to believe in you, you want us to get on board with you. Listen, the very first issue we got is that you've surrounded yourself with people that aren't that appealing socially. And so it does not befit us as leaders of our tribe and the wealthiest and most powerful men in Arabia. It does not befit us. It's not suitable. It's not suitable for us to associate with these people. And at that time, what did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tell the Prophet ﷺ in the Qur'an? وَاصْبِرْ نَفْسَكَ مَعَ الَّذِينَ يَدْعُونَ رَبَّهُمْ بِالْغَدَاتِ وَالْعَشِي يُرِيدُونَ وَجْهَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told him, tie yourself down. Literally, tie yourself down. To these people who do what? They remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala morning and evening. Alright? Yuriduna wajha. All they want out of this life is to please Allah. Wala ta'adu aynaka anhum. Don't let your eyes be distracted from these people. Meaning, don't overlook these people. Don't look beyond these people. You know how we say you look right through somebody? Like, man, I walked up there and he just, it's like he looked right through me. It's like I was invisible. He didn't even see me. Right? That's an expression in Arabic. وَلَا تَعْدُوا عَيْنَاكَ عَنْهُمْ Don't let your eyes like avert these people. Meaning don't overlook these, don't look straight through these people. Don't treat them like they're invisible, don't do that. وَلَا تَعْدُوا عَيْنَاكَ عَنْهُمْ تُرِيدُ زِينَةَ الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا Why? Because if you do that, then that means the only thing you're interested in is the vanity, is the adornment, is the, 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 the superficial material nature of this world. That's what you're interested in. If you are willing to overlook people of the caliber of Bilal and Khabbab, Alright, so don't overlook these. تُرِيدُ زِينَةَ الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا وَلَا تُطِعْ مَنْ أَغْفَلْنَا قَلْبَهُ عَنْ ذِكْرِنَا وَاتَّبَعَ هَوَاهُ وَكَنَا أَمْرُ فُرُطَى Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, do not follow these people. وَلَا تُطِعْ مَنْ أَغْفَلْنَا تُرِيدُ زِينَةَ الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا وَلَا Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells the Prophet don't follow these people whose hearts are devoid of the remembrance of Allah. And what do they do? They follow their own desires. وَكَنَا أَمْرُ فُرُطَى And everything that they're doing is in vain. So this is a very interesting dynamic. And I wanted to specifically mention this and talk about this, that you have to appreciate the fact that yes, these people, their condition was very bad. And these people were very, very lost. No doubt about the fact that they were very, very lost. But it does not change the fact that these people were still looking for an answer. You know, and even in our society today, in our da'wah efforts, in our da'wah efforts, you'll find that the people who are looking for some type of an answer, the people who bounce from church to church, the people who bounce from cult to cult, religion to religion, those are the people who often come and end up accepting Islam. But the people who conduct themselves, who live their lives with this arrogance of, I have no need of this spiritual uh, attachment. I have no need to try to attach myself emotionally to a higher being. And they say things like, religion is for the weak-minded, organized religion is for weak-minded people. Those types of people, they are more often than not, they're not very receptive to our da'wah. And forget about our da'wah, there could be a lot of shortcomings in us. We might not be doing our job right. Even when those type of people read the Qur'an, what do they come up with? They come up with objections, they come up with errors that they find in the Qur'an. But when somebody is on the search for truth, and that person reads the Qur'an, his life is instantly changed. That guy can't sleep at night. You know, and, and ask Imam Zia, ask anyone that's in this line of work, and they'll tell you that we get, we get calls at 2 in, 2 in the morning. We'll get emails. And if you look at the time of the email, the email will be time stamped at 3 a.m. We'll get messaged online, like in the middle of the night. And what is somebody saying? Somebody is, somebody's messaging us in the middle of the night, 2 a.m., 3 a.m., what are they saying? Saying, I read the Qur'an, 
I need to talk to somebody now. When can I come and accept Islam? I was visiting a community as a guest speaker one time in the Midwest region. I believe it was somewhere in Kansas. And it's a very small community, small masjid. And literally somebody calls one of the community members whose phone number was listed um, inside of the masjid on the bulletin board. So this gentleman must have come some random time during the middle of the day. It's a very small masjid, small community. Nobody's there. It's not like this, people walking in and out all day long. So he just picked up the first number that he saw on the bulletin board, one of the board members. He calls him up late at night, like at midnight, and says, I want to come and accept Islam right now. And it's like, well, nobody's there right now. When's the first chance I can get to come and accept Islam? So he said, okay, we're going to be praying the morning prayer at 6 a.m. I was there as a guest speaker. So I was going for Salaf al-Fajr and going to give a khatar afterwards. This, this gentleman, this guy shows up 6 a.m. in the morning to a masjid. Why I need to accept Islam? So you have to appreciate that fact that this was that condition where they, they felt the need for spirituality, where they would worship dirt if that's all they could find. If the only thing they could figure out was to worship a rock, they were doing it. Yes, very bad, very reprehensible, not acceptable. But at the same time, appreciate the fact that these people are still searching for the truth. And that's exactly what the Messenger of Allah did when he, when he started preaching to them. So... Having said that, we talked a lot in detail about the spiritual condition and the spiritual state of pre-Islamic Arab society. What I wanted to talk about today was a very specific dynamic that was existent at that time. And it was a very, very extremely small minority to the point where it's not even, you couldn't even classify it as a group or a demographic. It was literally individuals. And that was, was the true form of religion the worship of one Allah to their worship of one Allah, was that completely lost? Was that completely lost at that time? For the masses, generally speaking, yes. But there were individuals who held, who held on to a deen al-Hanif. Alright, the, the true deen, the millah of Ibrahim, the path of Ibrahim, the religion of Ibrahim, the faith of Ibrahim, they held on to that. There were a few people, and they were literally known as al hunafa they were known as Hunafa, which is a plural of the word Hanif. And even the word Hanif is a very interesting word in the Arabic language. There, oftentimes when you read translations, you'll find it's a very difficult word. People have a lot of difficulty translating this word. And that's why when you read different Qur'an translations, you'll literally find like six different translations of the word. So what does the word mean? The, the best way to understand the meaning of this word is when you look at some of the root of the word and especially some of the derivatives of the word. How was this word used by pre-Islamic Arabs? Way, way back in the day. The ancient Arabs, how did they use this word? So the ancient Arabs, they would say, Ahnafar, uh, Rajulun Ahnaf. They would say, Rajulun Ahnaf. Which means, you, you, you know what pigeon toad means? Pigeon toad? Pigeon toad is when, you know normally when people walk their feet point outwards. Pigeon toad means that when somebody walks, their feet point slightly inwards. All right, it's not like a physical deformity, but it's kind of awkward looking, right? It's, it's a very distinct way of walking. So that means pigeon toad. But what I want you to picture is somebody whose feet are very severely turned in. Not just simply pigeon toad, all right, but severely turned in to the point where it's like a birth defect. Like almost like a physical disability. When a child is born, feet are completely curved or turned in. Almost like clawed in. Alright? And, and that's something that occasionally happens with children. Um, especially these days, they have a lot of ways that they can repair that and make that better. Um, through different, you know, shoes and surgery later on and things like that. But nevertheless, in olden times, before they came up with a lot of these corrective procedures, it, was very, it wasn't very common, but you would see it. Every now and then you would see somebody with their feet very, very much turned in. So, Rajulun Ahnaf would refer to that person whose feet were turned in. Why? Because when somebody normally walks, their feet point outwards, right and left, right and left. But when this man walks, his feet point in which direction? Towards the center, towards the middle. So, Rajulun Ahnaf literally meant this, the man who walk, constantly walks towards the middle. The man who constantly centers he walks towards the middle. He stays centered. Because his feet don't point outwards, they point inwards. So he walks towards the center. So they call him Rajul and Ahnaf. Similarly, even in classic and modern Arabic, the word for a faucet, the word for a faucet or a water tap is Hanafiya. Hanafiya means water tap or water faucet. Alright? The reason for that again is because imagine you have a tank of water like you see here, right? 
outside of the masjid, they have that huge water tank that says city of Irving on it real big, right? So you have these huge water tanks, all right? So size of this room, all right? But imagine you have only one faucet or one tap on the outside of it. What does that faucet or that tap do to all of this water contained in this big old container? What does it do? It streamlines it, it focuses it. That's why the closest that we can get to the, uh, the understanding of the word Hanif is that it means focused. Someone who is focused. Someone who is constantly focused. Doesn't look right, doesn't look left. And that's why in the supplication of Ibrahim alayhi salam, that is actually one of the ad'iyatul um, al-siftah. It is one of the opening supplications within the prayer, within the salah. Inni wajahtu wajhiya lilladhi fatara samawati wal arda hanifan. Hanifan. That I have turned myself completely, wholeheartedly. I have dedicated and devoted myself completely to the one who originated the heavens and the earth, brought the heavens and the earth into existence from nothingness. Hanifan. And I am focused. I am centered. I will not be distracted. I will stay focused on Allah. Alright, so that's what Hanif means. So the, there were a few, very, very, literally like a dozen or so individuals in pre-Islamic Arabian society at the time of the birth of the Prophet who were known as Al-Hunafa. The Qur'an refers to them as Al-Hunafa, the Prophet called them Hunafa. And we even have evidence, we even have narrations that even the pre-Islamic Arabs ironically would call them Hunafa. Which is very funny because they're giving them a very praiseworthy title, but yet we're not comfortable with these people's beliefs, but still had no objection, no problem calling them as Hanif. So it's very ironic, it's really interesting. But nevertheless, these people were known as Hunafa. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala refers to them, مَا كَانَ إِبْرَاهِيمُ يَهُودِيًّا وَلَا نَصْرَانِيًّا وَلَكِنْ كَانَ حَنِيفًا مُسْلِمًا That Ibrahim was a Hanif, he was the original Hanif. Alright? قُلْ صَدَقَ اللَّهِ Say that Allah has spoken the truth. فَاتَّبِعُوا مِلَّةَ إِبْرَاهِيمَ حَنِيفًا Follow the way of Ibrahim, the path, the faith of Ibrahim, Hanif and focused. وَمَا كَانَ مِنَ الْمُشْرِكِينَ Alright, and he, he was not from amongst those people who associate partners with Allah. So they were known as the Hunafa. Now there were, there were many of them, there's a list of them that probably extends a little bit beyond a dozen or so of them. But there were a few of them who were very noteworthy. And I wanted to go ahead and talk about some of them today because I, I'm only going to highlight about four or five of them who actually interacted with the Prophet ﷺ in some way or another. Because it was a very interesting interaction. Why? Because these are the last few, like literally, um, you know, just the last few glimpses. The last few glimpses, like sparks of Tawheed present in the world at that time. Because remember, Christianity has been polluted. Christianity by that time, point in time has already been predominantly polluted. In the sense of the belief in Trinity, all right, accepting Jesus as the Son of God, this is very prevalent at that time amongst Christians. A Christian that is a true muwahid is very, very extremely rare. In fact, those Christians would just be, they were actually categorized under the Hunafah because they didn't even follow the predominant, the popular Christian doctrine at that time. Alright, and similar, uh, similarly, same in terms of the people of the Jewish faith at that time, Jews of that time. M majority of the Jews at that time were no longer following the Torah by the letter of the word. By that point in time, it was rabbinical law that was at that, the, uh, the tradition of the, of the Jewish religion at that time. So they were m more so following the rabbis than they were the letter of the law of the Torah. In fact, the Torah, they, were, they were just told, don't worry about what the Torah says, you don't understand the Torah, you don't have the capacity to understand the Torah, just do what we're telling you to do. And Allah tells us, what were they telling them to do? يُحَرِفُونَ الْكَلِمَ عَمَّ وَاضِعِهِ وَنَسْوَحَضًا مِمَّا ذُكِرُوا بِي They were literally changing things around, moving things around, they were altering the word, that, the message of the Torah itself. So, based on that observation, these were very, very few last little sparks and glimpses of Tawheed present in the world at that time. And what's very interesting is some of them when they came into contact with the Prophet ﷺ, even before his message or after his message initiated, all right, they believed in him. Or they saw the signs of the coming Prophet in him. And so they, they at least expressed their desire to want to follow him if they were still around when the message became public. 
or the re- revelation arrived, or if they were still al- around by the time revelation came, then they accepted Islam and they followed the Prophet ﷺ. But there were some of them, very interestingly, who while they were sure, they were still holding on to that essence of Tawheed, they still had enough arrogance within them to where they could not get on board with the Prophet ﷺ and his message. That was asking way too much. That was asking too much. Alright, like, alright, fine, I'm okay with this concept of one God, fine, that makes a lot of sense, but I'm not gonna listen to you. I can't listen to you. Alright, because I think I know more than you. Or whatever their condition, their situation was. So I wanted to go ahead and just briefly highlight some of these individuals. The first one of, amongst them is Zayd bin Amr bin Nufayl. Zayd bin Amr bin Nufayl. Ibn Ishaq narrates from the, the Isnad that goes back to Asma bint Abi Bakr uh, radiallahu ta'ala anhuma. She says, لَقَدْ رَأَيْتُ زَيْدَ بْنَ عَمْرِ بِنْ نُفَيْلِ مُسْنَدًا ظَهْرَهُ إِلَى, إلى الْكَعْبَ She says that I saw Zayd bin Amr bin Nufayl leaning against the Kaaba. So he was sitting there in the haram, leaning against the Kaaba. يَقُولْ يَا مَعَشُ الْقُرَيْشِ and he's addressing the Quraysh. This is the Kaaba. This is where everybody's congregating. And this is where the leaders of the Quraysh would meet. This is where they would have their nadwa, their meeting as well. City Hall was here. And so he says, Ya Ma'ashir Quraysh. Right, he's a very old, wise, learned man amongst them. To them, he was just an eccentric old man. You know, when you have somebody who's very knowledgeable, he's very wise, everybody respects him, he's very respected in the community, but he's just kind of eccentric, he just has a few eccentricities. Everybody just says, yeah, that's kind of his thing, just leave him alone. Alright? So, he just, this is an eccentric old man. But nevertheless, he's very respected in the community. So he says, Ya Ma'ashar Quraysh, O society of Quraysh, وَالَّذِي نَفْسُ زَيْدٍ بِيَدِهِ I swear by the one who has Zayd's life in his hands. I swear by the one who holds Zayd's life in his hand. So he's swearing by Allah. His name is Zayd. He's saying, I swear by the one who holds my life in his hand. مَا أَصْبَأَ أَحَدٌ مِنْكُمْ عَلَى دِينِ إِبْرَاهِيمْ غَيْرِي He says, none of you is truly upon the religion of Ibrahim except for myself. Other than myself, none of you are on the religion, true religion of Ibrahim. So she says, I remember him saying these things even before the Prophet ﷺ received divine revelation and started preaching to the people. He, ثُمَّ يَقُولَ And then he would say, Allahumma. He would sit there in the haram and he would make dua. He would say, Allahumma, O Allah, إِنِّي لَوْ أَعْلَمُ أَحَبَّ الْوُجُوهِ إِلَيْكَ عَبَدْتُكَ بِهِ He would say, Oh Allah, if I knew what is the most beloved way of worshipping you, like if I knew what type of worship you approve of, you love the most, I would worship you in that way, in that manner. I would do it. Oh Allah, but I don't know. I'm just trying to figure this out. There's literally very little left of your true message here today, in the world today. And so I don't even know what you want from me, oh Allah. But if I knew, I would do it. If I knew, I would do it. وَلَكِنِّي لَا أَعْلَمْ But I don't know. Oh Allah, there's no, I, I just don't know. I don't know where to access it, where to get it from. ثُمَّ يَسْجُدَ عَلَى رَاحِلَتِهِ And then he would literally make sajda there. وَكَانَ يُصَلِّي إِلَى الْكَعْبَ He would come and he would pray. See, he would do sajda, he would do sujood. And the, uh, the narrations say about him, وَكَانَ يُصَلِّي إِلَى الْكَعْبَ When he would come and pray near the Kaaba in the haram, he would pray in the direction of the Kaaba. Like he would pray face towards the Qibla, and he would pray in that direction. So you see the remnants, you see this adherence to the original religion of Ibrahim. وَيَقُولُ إِلَٰهِ إِلَٰهُ Ibrahim. He would say, my God is the God of Ibrahim. My deity is the deity of Ibrahim. My Lord is the Lord of Ibrahim. وَدِينِي دِينُ Ibrahim. And my religion is a religion of Ibrahim. That's all I know. So that's what he would say. And he really, literally didn't know what to do beyond that. وَكَانَ يُحْيِي الْمَوْؤُودَةِ And it even talks about the fact that, and this is a very profound reality. When true iman exists, when any semblance of a relationship with Allah is truly present in the heart, when the heart is actually connected to Allah at any level, it will bring about morality. It will it obligates a person towards morality. You understand what I'm saying? What I'm saying is that when, when spirituality is alive at any level within a person, then social awareness, that person starts to become socially aware. That person will feel the need, will feel obligated to be ethically and morally upright. To be a good person, to put it in simple words. Alright, I'm using big, big words. To just be a good person. Alright, feeling spiritually connected in any way, shape or form, makes a person feel like, I gotta be a good person. I gotta find a way to be a good person. 
And this is a very, very important reality we have to come to terms with. Do we find morality? Do we find ethics? Do we find morality outside of spirituality? Like people who are not truly connected with us? Sure, yes. But then always remember, it is either short-lived or it is based off of a specific idea or agenda or motive. But the true selflessness and the true awareness of what it means to be good for the sake of being good. Just being good because that's what you're supposed to do. Regardless of what the situation, the circumstances, the condition is. All right? That comes with that connection with Allah. Now we find a contradiction to that in our society, don't we? Even in our Muslim community. You can find a person who, quote unquote, is a very spiritual person, a very devout person. This person prays more than anybody else I know. Right? They fast more than anyone else I know. They read Quran more than anyone else I know. But he's also the most horrible person I know. <laughs> right? That we, we know that that exists. It's a very unfortunate contradiction we have. You know what that tells you? People always ask me this question. People constantly ask me this question. And what I always tell them is, that right there, not for us. We don't judge anyone. It's not our job. It's not my business to go around passing judgment on people. I'm not supposed to sit here in the Muslim and say, good person, bad person, bad person, good. No, that's not my job. I'm saying for the person, him or herself. What they can realize based off of their social conduct, their behavior, their akhlaq or lack thereof, what they're supposed to realize is that I obviously lack something in spirituality. If I pray five times a day and I'm still a horrible person when talking and dealing with people, that obviously means that I have a shell of prayer. I don't really truly pray. Understand the difference? I, I, I fulfill the obligation. I, I go through the motions. I do a Qiyam Ruku Institute. I flap my gums for three minutes. And that's what I do. But I don't pray. I don't pray. I need to correct my prayer. Because something is missing. Something lacks. Alright, so... This man, Zayd bin Amr bin Nufayl, like we just talked about, he had some spiritual awareness. So what does it tell about him? وَكَانَ يُحِيَ الْمَوْؤُدَ We know a very unfortunate practice in pre-Islamic Arabian society, part of the social evils that I did not talk about specifically before was that they would, it was part of their culture. It wasn't rampant, like not every single person did this, but it was still very, very... Um, it, it was very common within that culture that people would kill, would bury alive their daughters, especially, and it, it needs some explanation, especially if the firstborn, if the firstborn was a daughter, like the very first child a man had was a girl, was a daughter, then at that time he felt. And even that was not amongst the elite. The elite did not do this. Because even their women would have a lot more power and control and respect than even men in middle class and lower class society. It was mainly in middle to lower class society. All right, When their very first born child was a girl, they felt the need to go and bury her alive. Like as an offering to the God so that it would be followed with the son. And this was a great crime and a great tragedy that occurred during that time and that era. The Quran talks about it. وَإِذَا الْمَوْؤُدَةُ سُئِلَتْ that girl that was buried alive, she'll be asked, بِأَيِّ ذَنْبٍ قُتِلَتْ Due to what sin, what wrong could she possibly have done that she deserved to be killed? That in exchange for that, she was killed. Alright, so that was a very, very bad thing. What kind of يُحِيَ الْمَعُودَ But Zayd bin Amr bin Nufayl was this guy on a mission. He was a man on a mission. He would go around trying to save these girls from being killed, from being buried alive. It was literally what he would do. He would literally find out that if he'd hear the news, in this home, the firstborn was a daughter and they're probably gonna try to bury her alive. He would literally step in and he said, listen, if you want no part of this girl, just hand it over to me. You don't have to worry about it. You can consider her dead or buried or whatever you want to. Just let me take care of her. But just please don't kill this baby girl. Don't kill this innocent child. وَكَانَ يُحِيَ الْمَوْؤُدَةِ وَيَقُولُ لِلْرَجُلْ إِذَا أَرَادَ أَنْ يُقْتَلَ إِبْنَتَهُ When he would find a man who was intending to go and kill his newborn daughter, لَا تَقْتُلْهَا Don't kill her. إِدْفَاهَا إِلَىٰ أَكْفَلِهَا Give her to somebody who can take care of her better. Meaning, let me take care of her. I'll find somebody to take care of her. I'll take care of her. But please don't kill her. فَإِذَا تَرَى رَعَتْ فَخُذْهَا وَإِن شِئْتَ فَدْفَعْهَا If she starts to find a place in your heart, then please keep her. She's your daughter. If you become emotionally attached to her, then keep her. But if you don't, then give her up, give her away. I'll take care of her. I'll take her away from you. You'll never have to hear from her, see her ever again. As far as you're concerned, she's dead. All right, but please don't bury this girl. Don't kill her. 
So this this was the quali- uh, quality and caliber of this man. And and Zayd bin Amr bin Nufail كان يرفض الأكل من ذبائح قريش. Similarly, he was also very particular. He didn't indulge. He didn't want to sanction. He didn't want to show any type of approval for some of the very shirk-like practices that were prevalent in the Quraysh at that time. So when they would sacrifice animals on the names of the gods, the different idols and false gods and deities, he would not eat from those sacrifices. He would not go to the feasts that were done, the celebrations that were done in the name of the, the, the idols. He would not participate. إِنِّي لَسْتُ آكِلْ مِمَّا تَذْبَحُونَ عَلَىٰ أَنصَابِكُمْ وَلَا آكِلْ إِلَّا مَا ذَكَرَ إِسْمَ اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ He would say that, I do not eat from that which you sacrifice for your idols. And similarly, I do not eat except that which is sacrificed only and only in the name of God. In the name of Allah. Only that which is sacrificed and killed in the name of Allah, I will eat from that. Outside of that, I don't want, don't bring me your food. Don't invite me to these idol worshipping parties, these feasts. Don't, please don't include me in this stuff. I have no business. I have no interest in this. وَيُعِبُ عَلَىٰ قُرَيْتَ ذَبَائِحَهُمْ And when they would sometimes be having these feasts or they would be making sacrifices in the name of the gods and the idols, he would show up and he would even reprimand them, he would chastise them, he would advise them. يَقُولْ أَشَّادْ خَلَقَهَ اللَّهِ This goat that you're about to kill, Allah created it. وَأَنزَلَ لَهَا مِنَ السَّمَاءَ الْمَاءِ And Allah is the one that rains down water from the sky for this goat. وَأَنبَتَ لَهَا مِنَ الْأَرْضِ And Allah is the one that allowed vegetation to grow from the earth to feed this goat. ثُمَّ تَذْبَحُونَ عَلَىٰ غَيْرِ إِسْمِ اللَّهِ And then after all of that process, you sacrifice it for someone other than Allah? What's wrong with you people? What's wrong with y'all? What's going on up here? And so he would, he would advise them in this way. And that's why it's mentioned about Zayd bin Amr bin Nufayl that he passed away before the Prophet ﷺ received this message. He passed away before the Prophet ﷺ received his message. But the Prophet ﷺ is narrated to have said about him um, in authentic narrations. The Prophet ﷺ is narrated to have said, يُحْشَرُ ذَاكَ أُمَّةً وَحْدَهُ that man, Zayd bin Amr bin Nufail, will be resurrected on the day of judgment as an ummah by himself. Yuhsharu dhaka ummatan wahdahu. He will be resurrected as an ummah by himself. Baini wa baina Isa ibn Maryam. As the ummah that existed between me and between Isa ibn Maryam. As we know based on the variety of narrations, Ibn Kathir is of the opinion that there were about 500 some odd years between the Prophet ﷺ and Isa alayhi salam. Other historians are of the opinion it was closer to 600 some odd years. Nevertheless, you know, that's just a slight difference of opinion of 80 years here or there. But nevertheless, there was about five to six hundred years between the Prophet ﷺ and Isa alayhi salam. And that's why I mentioned this previously. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Yaseen, لِتُنْذِرَ قَوْمًا مَا أُنْذِرَ أَبَاؤُهُمْ You have been sent to warn a people that their forefathers were not warned. Five hundred years no message has come to these people. فَهُمْ غَافِلُونَ That's why these people are so lost. So empathize with them. Don't talk down to them, empathize with them. Sympathize with them, empathize with them. Connect with them. Realize where they're coming from. Alright? And they will eventually get to where you need them to be from. First, keep in mind where they're coming from. So because of that long duration, the Prophet ﷺ is saying that the long duration that existed between me and Isa alayhi salam, Zayd bin Amr bin Nufail will be resurrected as an ummah, the ummah of that era. By himself, wahdahu. Another narration says, يُبْعَثُ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ أُمَّةً وَحْدَهُ He will be resurrected on the Day of Judgment as an ummah all by himself. And he will be brought before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then the Prophet ﷺ says in another narration, talking about, um, you know, uh, either during the journey of Al-Isra wal Mi'raj or through one of his dreams, in which the Prophet ﷺ was show, shown Jannah, shown paradise. He says, Dakhaltul Jannah. Dakhaltul Jannah. I entered paradise. فَرَأَيْتُ لِزَيْدِ بْنَ عَمْرِ بِنْ نُفَيْلِ دَوْحَتَيْنِ I entered into paradise, into Jannah, and I saw reserved for Zayd bin Amr bin Nufayl for this man, Dohatain. Doha in the Arabic language means huge trees. Alright, just shajara is just a tree. Nakhla is like a date palm. Doha means like a humongous tree, like California redwoods. Alright, like California redwoods, like an unbelievable tree, like a tree that's like, like witnessing a miracle. A tree that's like witnessing a miracle. 
of Allah's creation. All right. So he says, I taught, I saw two magnificent, humongous, huge trees reserved for Zayd bin Amr bin Nufayl, for him to chill and for him to hang out underneath those trees in paradise in Jannah. So the Prophet ﷺ spoke about this man and how he will be given Jannah. And then of course this man, لَقَدْ لَقِيَ زَيْدْ بِنْ نُفَيْلِ الرَّسُولِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ He met the Messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم, but before prophethood. He met the Prophet ﷺ before prophethood. وَمَاتَ قَبْلَ أَنْ يَبْعَثَ الرَّسُولِ But he passed away before the Prophet ﷺ received divine revelation, received his message. Another individual, and this individual, I'm only going to talk about him very briefly, because he's going to come up later at one of the key moments, one of the greatest moments in the life of the Prophet ﷺ. So I'm just going to introduce you to who he was in his life before Islam, but then we'll be talking more about him and the role that he played within Islam, the, 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 the message, the arrival of the message. We'll talk about that later when we come to that occasion within the seerah, the prophetic biography, inshaAllah. That second individual is Warqa bin Nufayl. Uh, excuse me, Warqa bin Nawfal. Warqa ibn Nawfal. Alright, so Warqa bin Nawfal is that second individual, that second man. It's narrated about him that Zayd, the first individual I talked about, Zayd bin Amr bin Nufayl, he traveled outside of Arabia. He traveled to all the nearby regions, anywhere that he could find, anywhere that he could go, to try to find the truth, the message of the truth. Because you see, this man had this yearning to find the truth. So Warqa bin Nawfal also traveled with Zayd bin Amr bin Nufayl. He was like his travel buddy, he was his travel companion. They were, they were two men who saw very eye to eye. They did not agree, they were not comfortable with the spiritual state and the condition of Mecca at that time. He did, they did not feel comfortable with what was going on. So when Zayd told him that, listen, I leave, I'm going outside, I'm going to go travel around and try to find the truth. Waraqa bin Nawfal said, hey, mind if I roll with you? Alright, because I'm trying to find the truth as well. So they, he traveled with him quite a bit. يَبْعَثَ عَنْ دِينٍ صَحِيهٍ يَتَّبِعُ He was trying to find the true deen. But while traveling, he went a slightly different route than Zayd bin Amr did. And that was Zayd bin Amr came across Christianity. He came across Judaism, but he, was, he wasn't comfortable with what he found there either. So he just latched onto this idea of the deen of Ibrahim, the ilah of Ibrahim. And he said, I... My ilah is the ilah of Ibrahim, my deen is the deen of Ibrahim. I'm not really sure what that means, but nevertheless, I'm willing to stick to my guns about that. I'm gonna stick to my guns about that. Alright? Warqa bin Nawfil is slightly different. In his travels, he came across certain monks. Alright? Adherence to, uh, uh, to Christianity. People who were adhering to Christianity and they were practicing the Christianity of old, meaning they were practicing a slightly more cleaner version, purer version of Christianity. Where that's why, and that's why they had taken on monkism, they had separated themselves, secluded themselves from society, and they were living lives out as monks, all right, in little places of worship that they had established for themselves. Why? Because they weren't comfortable with Christian society and Christian culture and what was going on in terms of Trinity and Jesus, Son of God and things like that. So they kind of went off to the outskirts of society, civilization. They were living out there trying to practice the cleanest, purest form of Christianity that they could figure out for themselves. So Waraka bin Nawfal came into contact with these people and ended up becoming a Christian, but in this sense. And it's also said that he was the first one to translate the Bible, the Injil, into Arabic and bring it to Hijaz, bring it to the, the region where the, the Mecca, the Hijaz region. He was the one to bring the Bible there and he would literally, by hand, he would write, he would write copies and manuscripts of the Injil of the Bible and try to um, distribute amongst the people and try to teach it to people. And he had like a little circle of people that he was trying to teach and trying to bring around from Shirk over to Christianity. And so of course the, 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 the key role that he played later on, and we'll talk more about this, is that he was the cousin of Khadija radiallahu anha, the first wife of the Prophet sallallahu Khadija radiallahu anha, he was her cousin. All right. So when the Prophet ﷺ, and we'll be talking about this later in the seerah, of course, this is that great moment, that turning point, when the Prophet ﷺ received the first revelation, يَقْرَأَ بِسْمِ رَبِّكَ الَّذِي خَلَقَ And the Prophet ﷺ came back from there, came down from the cave, and came home, and he was shaken up, and he spoke to Khadija, and told her everything that had happened. Who did she end up taking him to? She took him to her cousin, who knew a little bit about scriptures and prophets and things like that. That was Warqa bin Nawfal. That was this man. And he, so she took him to Warqa bin Nawfal, and when she took him there, the, Warqa said 
to the Prophet ﷺ and to Khadija, وَإِن يَكُوا صَادِقًا فَإِنَّ هَذَا نَامُوسْ مِثْلَ نَامُوسْ مُوسَى That if he speaks the truth, that this angel that he talks about that came to him, is the same angel, the same messenger that would come to Musa alayhi salam. Same angel that would come. فَإِنْ بَعَثَ وَأَنَا حَيْ فَإِنْ بَعَثَ وَأَنَا حَيْ If he is sent out to preach this message by Allah, and I am still alive, فَسَأُعَزِّزُهُ I will not only respect him, but I will support him. I will fully back him and support him, put all my influence and my power behind him. وَأَنصُرُهُ I will help him in his message. وَأُؤْمِنُ بِهِ And I will believe in him. And I will believe in him. So this is the story. This is who Warqa bin Nufil was, and of course, so he proclaims this belief in the Prophet ﷺ, and that's why the scholars do classify him as somebody who did accept Islam or he believed. But nevertheless, he was an adherent to Tawheed, and he was practicing this and preaching this much, much before um, even the divine revelation. So he's one of those Hunafa that was present in that society at that time. A third individual, very interesting, and this is where you get to see slightly the other side of things. There was another man by the name of Qus bin Sa'idah al-Iyadi. Qus bin Sa'idah al-Iyadi. So Qus, this man, Ubada bin Samit radiallahu anhu, and others also narrate that when the wafad of Iyad, Iyad was a tribe. Iyad was a tribe. So much, much later, when the caravans and the, the envoys, the convoys started coming to the Prophet some tribes started arriving to accept Islam and to um, you know, uh, accept Islam and learn about Islam and, and uh, accept Islam at the hands of the Prophet ﷺ, one of those tribes or one of those caravans that came was from the tribe of Iyad. When they came, the Prophet ﷺ asked them about Qus bin Sa'idah. Say, so you, do you guys know about a man named Qus bin Sa'idah? فَذَكَرُوا لَهُ أَنَّهُ هَلَكَ they mentioned to him that, yeah, we, we remember him. He was one of our old timers, but he died now. He passed away. فَقَالَ النَّبِي صلى الله عليه وسلم, The Prophet ﷺ said at that time, لَقَدْ شَهِدْتُهُ يَوْمًا بِعُكَاذٍ I saw him one day at the place of Ukad. Ukad was a place right outside of Mecca. I talked about this in the previous uh, sessions. That Ukad was a place near Mecca where they used to have a huge festival every year. And they would get together there and they would have poetry competitions and they would worship the idols and they would do all of this type of fanfare. So it was like kind of like a big carnival, a big festival for them. So he says, I saw him there, ala jamalin ahmar. He was riding a red she camel. Yatakalam bi kalam in mu'jab. Mu'annaq. He was speaking in, he was speaking some words that were very astonishing. They were very surprising. They were really deep. He was saying some very deep, profound, mind blowing stuff. La ajiduni ahfaduhu. And then the Prophet says, I don't really remember what he was saying, but I just remember what he was saying was really deep and really profound. It was really mind blowing. فَذَكْرَ أَحَدُ أَفْرَادِ الْوَفَدِ One of the people in that caravan, he remembered, he said, أَنَّهُ يَحْفَدُ I remember some of the things he used to say. فَهُوَ يَا مَعَشَرَ النَّاسِ اجْتَمِعُوا He would say, oh people, come together, gather together. فَكُلُّ مَنْ مَاتَ فَاتَ Everyone who dies and that person has gone, he's perished. وَكُلُّ شَيْءٍ آتٍ آتٍ But every single thing will come, will come back later, will come back later. Meaning everything is coming, everything is coming. Meaning that, and this is almost like an expression, what he's basically saying is that everything you do in this world has a follow-up, has a consequence. And, the, and you're about to face the consequence of that thing. Laylu, Laylun Dajun. Night that is very, Laylun Dajin. Night that is very, very deep and dark. Wasama'un dhatu abrajin. And the sky that is full of forts, meaning sky that is full of stars. So a night that is very, very deep and dark, but at the same time it has like huge forts, like shining stars up in the sky. Wabahun ujajun. But at the same time you have the ocean that is raging with waves. Nujumun tazharu. Stars that, that, that twinkle in the sky. وَجِبَالٌ مُرْسَاتٌ And mountains that are deeply rooted into the earth. وَأَنْهَارٌ مَجْرَاتٌ وَأَنْهَارٌ مُجْرَاتٌ And you have rivers that are streams that are flowing within the earth. إِنَّ فِي السَّمَاءِ الْعِبَرًا In the sky there is a huge realization. There's a wake-up call waiting for you in the sky. Meaning look up and reflect at the sky and wake up. مَا لِي أَرَى النَّاسِ يَذْهَبُونَ فَلَا يَرْجِعُونَ Why is it that I see people that they go but they don't come back? أَرَضُوا بِالْإِقَامَةِ فَأَقَامُوا 
Did they become happy with where they had gone so they just stayed? Am taraku fanamu? Or they completely left the truth and they've just fallen asleep? Aqsama qassun, aqsama qussun, billahi qisman, qasaman la rayba fihi. He says that qus, he says his name, that I take an oath. I take an oath by Allah, and this is an oath that there is no doubt in it. Inna lillahi deenan. Verily for Allah there is a deen, there is a way of life. Huwa arda min deenikum hadha. And that deen that Allah has reserved is more pleasing to Allah than this deen that you people are practicing. Because I told you at Uqal, they would have festivities and they would celebrate this, their idols. So he gives them this long speech, this iman-inspiring talk. And then at the end of it, he would say, look, Allah has a deen. And that deen is more beloved than this deen that you people are practicing. And then he would read this type of poetry and he would try to advise the people. So this was another man, another individual that was present there at the time uh, before the message arrived to the Prophet So this was another hadith during the days of Jahiliyyah. Um, it doesn't really mention anymore about exactly what happened with him, what played out with him. But we just know that when his tribe people came to the Prophet the Prophet asked about him and they said he died, he passed away. But nevertheless, this was the perspective of that man. There was yet another man, a fourth individual that I'll tell you about who was a hanif, practicing that or living by this idea of oneness of God even before Islam in Arabian society and that was Umayyah bin Abi As-Salat Umayyah bin Abi As-Salat huwa alladhi qala fihi rasul kada Umayyah bin Abi As-Salat an an yuslima the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said that Umayyah was very close to accepting Islam Umayyah was very close to accepting Islam. وَفِي رِوَايَةٍ فَلَقَدْ كَادَ أَنْ يُسْلِمَ فِي شِعْرِهِ The Prophet in another narration says that Umayyah is very near to accepting Islam in his poetry. Meaning his poetry oozes of iman. His poetry reeks of iman. Oozes, drips iman. Very close. When you read his poetry, you feel like this guy was just about to become Muslim. Or he was very close to being a Muslim. And it's said about him that he... He was basically a practitioner of the Christian faith, <clears throat> but he used to recite and write a lot of poetry that would talk about Tawheed, that would talk about oneness of God. So again, he was not a pract- practitioner of like common, popular Christianity of that time, but a pure form of Christianity. And he would talk about resurrection on the day of ju- on the day of judgment, which was a very very radical idea for pre-Islamic Arab society. They thought that that was something they were absolutely not willing to be on board with. All right, and he was also known as one of the giants of poetry at his time. Kanamin fuhule shu'ara. He was known as one of the giants of poetry in his era. He lived until the time to where the Prophet ﷺ received divine revelation, but he did not accept Islam. He didn't accept Islam. Why? Takabburan an yakuna tabi'an lil rasul. He did not accept Islam out of arrogance. Because he said, I can't listen to what he tells me. He's like a kid. This is an elderly man. He's a giant of, he's an intellectual giant of his time in his era. He's a master poet of his time. Alright? He just felt it beneath himself, below himself to listen to the Prophet ﷺ. So he, he would talk about Tawheed, but he did not accept Islam. Even though the message came to him. Divine revelation had come, message came to him. He rejected it, refused it. Why? He was too arrogant to follow the Prophet ﷺ. And about him, the ayah of the Qur'an, many of the mufassirun and scholars say that this ayah of the Qur'an was revealed in regards to him. He is one of the people to, who, to whom this ayah applied, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Qur'an, وَتْلُوا عَلَيْهِمْ نَبَأَ الَّذِي آتِيْنَاهُ آيَاتِنَا This Surah Al-A'raf, ayah number 175, وَتْلُوا عَلَيْهِمْ Recite upon them, meaning relate to them. Naba alladhi, the story of the man. Alladhi atina hu ayatina. We gave him our ayat, meaning we gave him our signs. He could look at the sky and know, know, realize that there was something profound about it. He heard the Quran and he, he could recognize that there was something unique and distinct and divine about it. Atina hu ayatina. We gave him these signs. Fan salakha minha. But what did he do? He retreated from it. In salakha literally means to pull something out of something else. To extract something, to pull something out of something else. He literally extracted himself. He pulled himself out of that guidance. 
واتبع الشيط فانسلخ منها فاتبعه الشيء ف فتبع الشيطان فكان من الغاوين. He ended up following Shaytan and when, what ended up happening to him? He became from those people who were wandering about aimlessly through life. So he received all the signs, but out of his arrogance, very consciously, aware, uh, 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 very aware, very cognizant, very aware, very consciously, he pulled himself out of guidance, followed the Shaytan, and lived a life of just complete um, disillusion. Had no idea which purpose he was living his life for. Alright? It's said about him that he died either in the second year of Hijrah or he died in the um, ninth year of Hijrah. There's a variety of narrations. But he did not accept the psalm. But again, what goes to show you that he realized that there was some truth there. He actually wrote a poem. وَلَهُ شِعْرٌ فِي رِثَائِ قَدْ سَلَى قُرَيْشِ يَوْمَ بَدْرِ الْكُبْرَى he wrote a poem um, kind of memorializing the people who died in the Battle of Badr. He wrote a poem memorializing them, talking about them, that whether they were good or bad and what's going to happen to them now that they've died and in the afterlife what will transpire with them. So you see that this person had certain ideas, but yet his arrogance prevented him from believing. Um, yet another person, and this is I'll probably, this will be the last uh, person I talk about, uh, the fifth individual I'll tell you about who was from the Hunafa, people who believed in Tawheed even before Islam. The message of the Prophet ﷺ was Labid bin Rabi'a al-Amiri. He was also from one of the giants of poetry in the pre-Islamic era from the Zaman of Jahiliyyah, from the time of Jahiliyyah. وَمِنْ شُعَرَاءِ muallaqat. Not only that, but he received a very distinct honor of that time. His, some of his poetry was determined to be so eloquent, so profound, so great, that his, some of his poems were actually hung on the Kaaba and around the Kaaba. I talked about this before, that poetry that was deemed to be the, most, the best poetry of that time, would literally be hung from the Kaaba and around the Kaaba. It was called the Al Muallaqat, the hung poems. And they would be hung around the Kaaba because that was the most sacred place and that was a great honor for those poets. He was one of those poets that received that honor that during his lifetime his poems were actually hung up around the Kaaba. So he was a great poet of that time. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said about him, Asdaq Asdaq Kalimatin Qalaha Sha'irun Kalimatul Ubaid. Labid. The Prophet said that some of the truest words that a poet has ever spoken were the words of Labid. Were the words of Labid. These are some of the truest words, some of the most profound things that any poet has ever said. Were the words of Labid. Ala kullu shay'in ma khalallahu batilu. This very famous poet, poem that he said. And this word, the Prophet ﷺ said, this little phrase, this little couplet, this little snippet of his poems, are probably one of the most profound things that a poet has ever, ever said. And in fact, Islamic scholars throughout the centuries, throughout the generations, have always used this phrase, used this snippet of, of this poem of his, when talking about Allah. And they've always taught it to their students. We were taught this by our teachers as well. And that phrase is, أَلَا كُلُّ شَيْءٍ مَا خَلَى اللَّهُ بَاطِلُ أَلَا كُلُّ شَيْءٍ مَا خَلَى اللَّهُ بَاطِلُ He said, أَلَا, ala is like an exclamation in the Arabic language, in classic Arabic. It means, listen up. Pay attention, listen up. Allah, listen up. Kullu shay'in. Each and every single thing, ma khalallahu, other than Allah. Each and every single thing other than Allah, aside from Allah. Every single thing other than Allah, batilu. It is batil. What does batil mean? When we hear batil, we, we have a very specific meaning of that in our mind. It's the antonym of haq, correct? And we think of it in terms of like, haq is the truth, batil is falsehood. Not, that's, not how, that's not what it means in classical Arabic, in its roots. It is the antonym of the word haq. It is the opposite of the word haq. But the word haq in classical Arabic, in its roots, it means something that is on a solid foundation. The word haq means something that is solid. On solid footing, solid foundation is called haq. Batil is the opposite. Something that is unstable, is not on solid footing, is not on a solid foundation, is called batil. It's called batil. And that's why we know it as the Qur'an presents it to us as truth and falsehood. Because truth is on solid footing. It's established, it's truth. Alright? And that which is falsehood is called batil because it's very enjoyable. Ja'al haq wa zahaq al-batilu. 
إن الباطل كان زهوقا. That's why Allah says that. All right. So He's saying على كل شيء ما خلا الله باطل. Each and every single thing other than Allah is باطل. It has no foundation. It's here today, gone tomorrow. The only thing that is permanent, the only thing that is established is Allah. Everything other than Allah is مخلوق. It's creation. So therefore, it has no foundation. It is only in existence as long as Allah allows it to be in existence. When Allah deems it to be, when Allah decrees it to be non-existent, it'll be, go out of existence. That's very in line with that Quranic idea as well in Surah Rahman that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says, "Kullu man alaiha fan, kullu man alaiha fan, wa yabqa wajhu Rabbika dul jalali wa ikram." Each and every single thing on this earth in existence is fanning. It'll expire, it's running out, it's fading away. But the only thing that remains is the face of your Lord. The only the face of your Lord. كُلُّ شَيْءٍ هَالِكٌ إِلَّا وَجْهَ Each and every single thing is meant, is moving towards perishing, towards extinguishing, expiring, except for Allah. Except for His face, except for Allah. So this is some of the very profound words that Labid said. وَقَدْ أَسْلَمَ لَبِيدٍ and this po- this poet Labid, he actually accepted Islam. Wa mata fi khilafati Uthman. He died much much later during the Khilafah of Uthman bin Affan radiAllahu anhu. Baada an Asha mi'a wa khamsina aman. And Ibn Hajar al Asqalani rahimahullah. Ibn Hajar and um, other scholars like in Al Isaba, uh, fi ma'rifat al Sahaba in in Asad al Ghaba. All these other, all these different books that document and talk about the different companions and uh, people from the time of the Prophet sallallahu Many of these scholars they talk about the fact that he lived to be 150 years old. He lived till the age of 150. Alright, and then he passed away at that time. So this was a man with a lot of experience, had seen a lot, deep profound wisdom. And of course he accepted Islam and lived until the Khilafah of Uthman bin Affan radiallahu anhu. And there's, then, then there's a whole uh, list of people, another dozen or so individuals who were, you know, adherents to Tawheed. They adhered to Tawheed even in the pre-Islamic era. One of the uh, ones, that, a couple of them that I find that are very noteworthy is Ka'b bin Luwai bin Ghalib al Qurashi. Ka'b bin Luwai, uh, Luwai bin Ghalib al Qurashi, who is one of the great great grandfathers of the Prophet ﷺ. He is actually one of the forefathers, one of the great 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 grandfathers of the Prophet. ﷺ. He falls under this category of these people who were practitioners and preachers of Tawheed in a predominantly shirk-based society. All right? Another person that's named amongst them is Amr bin Abasa al-Sulami, um, who also accepted Islam, akramahullahu bil-Islam. Allah honored him by giving him Islam and allowing him to accept Islam. And then, one other name, and I'm not going to talk about him now because next week's session is going to focus solely on the immediate family of the Prophet ﷺ, and we'll talk about him in more detail next week. But one of the other individuals who's listed amongst the list of Hunafa, people who believed in Tawheed, oneness of God, pre-Islamically, all right, by some of the scholars, some of the historians, is actually Abdul Muttalib. Abdul Muttalib, the grandfather of the Prophet ﷺ. He's put in this list by a lot of scholars. And there's a huge discussion, we'll talk about it when we get there. But, and, and actually next week we're also going to be talking about the incident of the invasion of the elephants. Alright, Amul Fi, the year of the elephant and that great uh, incident that occurred. That just, um, you know, immortalized in the, in the surah of Al-Fil. أَلَمْ تَرَ كَيْفَ فَعَلَى رَبُّكَ بِأَصْحَابِ الْفِيلِ So we'll talk about it uh, in there. So some of his dialogue, some of his discourse, some of his ideas that he expressed, during that time, during the invasion of the elephants and that army of the elephants, it gives you a very clear indication of the fact that he was a very open practitioner and preacher and advocate of Tawheed. Not only that, but we also see in the words of the Prophet ﷺ, during the Ghazwa of Hunayn, after Fatih Makkah, the Battle of Hunayn, in which the Muslims were the majority, and we'll, of course we'll come to this much, much later in the seerah, Muslims were the majority, but something very interesting happened. There were a lot of new converts to Islam, and people who weren't quite established within their faith yet, and they, the army started to fall apart and break apart and disperse. And at that time, the Prophet ﷺ made a rallying cry. He made a rallying call, and he rallied together some of the older Sahaba, 
uh, some of the long-term Sahaba to rally together, and then the Muslims were able to overcome the advance from the enemy at that time. And that rally cry, that battle cry, that rallying call that the Prophet ﷺ made at that time, and this is mentioned in authentic narrations, is he said, "Ana Nabiyu la kadib." He started to say loudly in the battlefield, cry out in the battlefield, "Ana Nabiyu la kadib." I am the Prophet, and this is not a lie. أنا النبي لا كذب أنا ابن عبد المطلب I am the son of عبد المطلب Of course he means grandson All right, that's obviously understood All right, like when a grandson when a grandfather calls his grandson he calls him son All right, that, 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 that's just an expression it means he's my son, son of course so the Prophet is saying I am the son meaning I am the grandson of عبد المطلب and some of the scholars say that even the Prophet is proclaiming himself like that in battle against the enemy against non-Muslims that I am the son of عبد المطلب also is an indication of the fact that Abdul Muttalib was this very open advocate of Tawheed, even pre-Islamically. Allah Ta'ala Alam, Allah knows best. So that's a little bit about this, this small contingent, these scattered individuals who held on to this idea, this faith, this belief of the oneness of Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala, even pre-Islamically, um, even before um, the preaching and the teaching of uh, the message of the Prophet ﷺ, and even before the birth of the Prophet ﷺ. What we're going to be talking about next week is we'll be talking about the year of the, the invasion of the army of the elephants, and we'll also start talking about some of the immediate family members of the Prophet ﷺ. What I wanted to end with here today in these last two minutes was talking a little bit about the family history of the Prophet ﷺ. I wanted to talk about this very, very briefly. You know. Something very interesting that the scholars talk about is, you know, Lut alayhi salam. Lut alayhi salam. In the Quran, you know, when he when 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 he's de- dealing with that very difficult situation of, he's received these guests, these guests who were angels in the form of human beings, and the very immoral people of his society, his community, are making a very strong advance towards these people, towards these individuals, and he's trying to talk some sense into them. He's trying to talk some, some sensibility into them. He says at that, at that time, قَالَ لَوْ أَنَّ لِي بِكُمْ قُوَّةً I wish I had some strength to face you people, to deal with you people. أَوْ أَوِي إِلَى رُكْنٍ شَدِيدٍ Or I could go back and lean on a very, very strong pillar. And what that's an expression of, what that means is I wish I had like family backing and family support. I wish I had like a family and a tribe to lean back on that would support me in this type of a difficult situation. The Prophet ﷺ came from a very, very prestigious, noble family. He came from a very amazing background, a very blessed lineage. And this isn't something superficial. While solely finding value for yourself in solely based on the family you come from or your lineage is superficial. Alright? It's spiritually superficial. Alright? Nevertheless, there is a certain value in it in the sense of it gave the Prophet ﷺ credibility to speak amongst his people because he was dealing with people who were very superficial, who were spiritually shallow, who would only listen to somebody if he came from a good family. And at the same time, it gave the Prophet some support. We all know Abu Talib didn't accept Islam but continued to support him and defend him. He was the defender, he was the gatekeeper to the Prophet ﷺ. They couldn't get near him, they couldn't harm him, couldn't lay a finger on him while he was alive. So it has a very, very strong significance. And the Prophet of Allah ﷺ says um, in a narration in the hadith, إِنَّ اللَّهَ اصْطَفَى كَنَانَ مِنْ وُلْدِ إِسْمَعِيلِ Allah said, selected Kanana from the children of Ismail. وَاسْتَفَى قُرَيْشًا مِنْ Kanana, And then he selected the tribe of Quraysh from Kanana. From that overall lineage of Kanana. وَاسْتَفَى مِنْ قُرَيْشْ بَنِي Hashim, And then Allah chose, selected Banu Hashim, the family of the Khandan, what we call in Urdu, the extended family of Banu Hashim from Quraysh, from the tribe of Quraysh. وَاسْتَفَى مِنْ بَنِي Hashim, And he chose me from Banu Hashim. Meaning I have been selected from the cream of the cream of the cream of the cream of crop. I come from the best, the purest of the purest of the purest of the purest. And it gave him that credibility. The Prophet of Allah وسلم, says in another narration, In Allah Azza wa Jal Yawma Khalaq al Khalqa Jalani fi Khairihim. The day when Allah created the creation, He put me amongst the best people. Then when Allah distributed the people further, He put me in the better 
group amongst the two distributed groups. ثُمَّ حِينَ جَعَلَ الْقَبَائِلْ جَعَلَنِي فِي خَيْرِ قَبِيلًا Then when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala distributed further the people into tribes, He put me in the best of tribes. ثُمَّ حِينَ جَعَلَ الْبُيُوتِ جَعَلَنِي فِي خَيْرِ بُيُوتِهِمْ Then when Allah amongst the tribe distributed the homes, Allah put me in the best of homes. فَأَنَا خَيْرُهُمْ نَسَبًا وَخَيْرُهُمْ بَيْتًا I am from amongst the best of people when it comes to lineage and I am from amongst the best of people when it comes to homes. The house I came from, the family I came from. And that's why when Abu Sufyan stood before Qaysar, the emperor of Rome, and, and when he was asked about Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa when he was asked, do you think he's doing this just to gain some prominence amongst your people? Like he has some ulterior motive? Abu Sufyan said, no, huwa fina dhu nasab. Huwa fina dhu nasab. He belongs to a very high, esteemed lineage. Amongst us, there's no way. I mean, he comes from the best family you can imagine. So that's not why he did this. And so something very profound, something that is a miracle of the life of the Prophet ﷺ, and is a beauty of the setting, the seerah, is that the entire lineage of the Prophet ﷺ is preserved till Adam ﷺ. His entire lineage is preserved till Adam ﷺ. No other human being can claim this. His lineage is preserved all the way till Adam alayhi salam. There are three basic parts of the lineage. I'll just read it to you here. The first part of it is unanimously accepted. It's documented. It's surefire. The second part of it, there are a few differences of opinion about a few names here and there. But it's still documented. And then the third part of it is after Ibrahim alayhi salam. And that part of it, of course, um, is well established as well. Muhammad ibn Abdullah, Muhammad the son of Abdullah, bin Abdul Muttalib, bin Hashim, bin Abd Munaf, bin Qusay, bin Kila, bin Kulab, bin Murra, bin Kaab, bin Luay, bin Ghalib, bin Fahar, bin Malik, bin Nadar, bin Kanana, bin Khuzayma, bin Mudrika, bin Ilyas, bin Mudar, bin Nazar, bin Muad, bin Adnan. This part of it is well established. From there it goes, bin bin Uwad, bin Humaysa, bin Salaman, bin Aus, bin Buz, bin Qimwal, bin Ubay, bin Awam, bin Nashid, bin Hiza, bin Baldas, bin Yadlaf, bin Tabikh, bin Jahim, bin Nahish, bin Mahi, bin Aid, bin Abqar, bin Ubaid, bin Addu'a, bin Hamdan, bin Sambar, bin Yathrabi, bin Yahzan, bin Yalhan, bin Ar'awi, bin Aid, bin Dishan, bin Aysar, bin Afnad, bin Ayham, bin Maqsar, bin Nahith, bin Zarih, bin Sami, bin Mazi, bin Awda, bin Aram, bin Qaydar, bin Ismail, bin Ibrahim alayhim as it then continues after Ibrahim alayhi salam, bin Azar, bin Nahur, bin Saruq, bin Ra'u, bin Falih, bin Abir, bin Shalikh, bin Arfash, bin Arfakh, Shad, bin Sam, bin Nuh alayhi salam, bin Lamik, bin Matu, Matu Shalikh, bin Idris alayhi salam, bin Yadid, bin Mih, Mihlilal, bin Qinan, bin Anushat, bin Sheath, bin Adam alayhi salam. This is the entire lineage of the Prophet ﷺ. And what's remarkable is, there are scholars, that we were actually made to memorize this, I haven't probably reviewed it in a while, so I had to read it off of my notes. But we were made to memorize this, thousands, thousands of scholars around the world have the entire lineage of the Prophet ﷺ memorized. Millions of scholars and people throughout our 1400 year history have the entire lineage of the Prophet ﷺ memorized and they don't even know their own lineage beyond their own grandfather, great-grandfather. That is the esteem, the respect, the honor, the dignity that Allah has granted to Muhammadur Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us all the reality of who he was. May Allah allow us to develop true love for the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Inshallah next week we'll continue with our series on the prophetic biography. We'll be talking about the army, uh, the invasion of the army of elephants. And we'll start talking about the individuals who were immediately related to the Prophet sallallahu like his father, mother, grandfather, Etc. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the ability to practice everything that was said and heard. Jazakumullah khairan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.